Hi, this is Dave Roundtree, author of Paranormal Technology, Understanding the Science of Ghost Hunting, lecturer, author, and paranormal researcher. And when you're not uh, busy in the field, do what I do and listen to The Mallard Report with Jim Mallard. The opinions expressed in The Mallard Report are those of the hosts and participants and are not intended to and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of any simulcasting radio network or sponsor. All listeners are advised to make their own decisions. It's the Mallard Report. Yeah, the Mallard Report. The Paranormal Talk Radio Show with Jim Mallard as your host. See what life beneath any parent. Hello, everybody. My, I hope everybody's having a good night, good afternoon, good at whatever time it is. The show goes around the world, so it just baffles my mind at times. But I've got Shepard Hoodlin on the line, and I want to thank him for taking part of his day out. We scheduled this a couple weeks ago, and then between him and me, and uh, it's just been a mess. But I want to thank him for making some time for me still. So how are you doing today, Shepard? I'm great. How are you? I can't complain at all. But no one would li- – well, I guess they would li- – well – I always say they would listen, but I, I get the feeling they'd probably turn me off if I started complaining too much on air. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what's how, how have you been since last time I interrupted? Well, last time you were on, we were talking about enlightenment for nitwits. So I'm looking over at my bookshelf, and there it is. So I, thank, thankfully, it's there because if I've totally duffed on that title. So what's what's new? I mean, besides, we're going to talk about the other books. So anything? Are you writing something else or? Well, my book, Journey of Your Soul, a channel explores the Michael teachings. Uh, the second edition was just published by North Atlantic Books. Uh, it was released on April 23rd. So I'm here to speak about that book today mostly. Uh, very different from the humor book. Uh, this is uh, an exploration of something called the Michael teachings, which is a fascinating body of channel material that explains how we as souls set up our lifetimes, how we got to be who we are, where we are, doing what we're doing. And it also explores the phenomenon of channeling itself, how it works, kind of the the inside story on that. And so I thought maybe today we could talk about your Michael reading chart, which uh, consists of over 20 pieces of information, 20 categories that Michael defines as... uh, Areas in which we manifest as souls. Yeah, we can we can go over that. Give me a little more of a. I mean, it, you were saying how we define our lifetimes. Is it when when does that process happen? Give me a little crash course, a little background on what's going on there. One of Michael's favorite uh, sayings is that all is choice. So Michael is the name of the entity that I and several other people channel, and uh, the teaching is about how to be happier, more loving, more effective here in our lives. Uh, It's not about getting away from the world, but about how to bring our soul nature into our lives. And so uh, they teach that at the very beginning of things, uh, we as a spark of the Tao, unit of consciousness and the all that is, decided to begin a great journey or adventure uh, and come to planet Earth and be a human being for several lifetimes. Now, there are many games that Sparks of the Tao can play in the universes, and this is just uh, one of them, but this is obviously what we chose to do. And so when we chose to do that, we chose the vehicle, the model of soul that we were going to have to take us to Earth and carry us from lifetime to lifetime, and that is called the soul. So we chose one of seven soul types, which are server and priest, artist and sage, warrior and king, and scholar. And you and I both chose the sage model for this series of lifetimes. 
at that point, when we're first starting out, we also team up with other souls for various kinds of relationships. We choose an essence twin or twin soul or twin flame. Uh, yours is the role of scholar, and because of that, you have some scholar traits in addition to your sage traits because your twin soul's energy bleeds through and mixes with your own to some degree. We assemble into larger groupings of souls, and we have a specific position within those groupings that uh, flavor us, that dictate how we will uh, manifest, in your case, your soul sage soul energy, and uh, we choose our ratio of male to female energy and so forth. So that's when that happens. And then when we're ready to start incarnating before every individual lifetime, we have another set of choices to make. What kind of person do I want to be in this particular lifetime? Uh, what personality traits will I have? So, for example, you choose a goal, which is what's going to motivate you through that lifetime. It could be growth, it could be acceptance, it could be dominance, it could be flow, and so forth. And, of course, you choose your parents, you make agreements with other souls, you have a particular body type that you are incarnating into that tells us a lot about what your physical experiences are like and so forth. And then during the lifetime, we make uh, a whole other series of ongoing choices, like we'll meet someone and our souls will get together and say, hey, let's explore something. This is kind of interesting because the soul doesn't know in advance everything that's going to happen in a lifetime. So there's all this behind-the-scenes activity going on spiritually that most of us aren't aware of, and the Michael teachings shine some light on that. That's just fascinating to me. So let's let's go back up to the, the sage personality, because the, the other ones, server, priest, are, I mean, that... But it's all kind of are straightforward. So what's the what's the sage about? Um, sages are communicators. Uh, we seek to express ourselves. We um, love insight above all else. It's uh, an intellectual uh, role. Uh, we love to understand why things are the way they are. We love to communicate with others. Uh, sages uh, specialize in comedy because humor when we laugh at something, it, it sheds light on that something. It makes us look at it in a different way. A lot of actors are sages, a lot of singers, musicians. It's all about self-expression. The positive pole is expression. The positive pole of any Michael Teachings trait is where that trait is manifesting in a clear, accurate, happy, undistorted way. And the negative pole is where it is distorted by fear, by uh, something constricting. And so one of the purposes of having your Michael chart is it gives you a guide to your strengths and weaknesses and what you want to try to avoid. So the negative pole of sage is oration. And the negative pole, sages seek attention for its own sake rather than using that platform to deliver something of weight and value and substance to other people. Hmm. So, I mean, it's fascinating because we're, you know, you write books and here I am talking about that. So it kind of fits what you're describing. So makes sense to me so far. So good. So what else do we have on here? Because it just seems, I see a bunch of things and it just kind of, it piques my interest when you, I see something like, the goal of growth, and you know, it just takes me to a different. I mean, I I believe that. I think out of those ones, it just makes sense. But well, we mentioned that um, your essence twin is a scholar, and you have a little bit of scholar energy. And scholars are similar to sages in that they love knowledge, uh, whereas sages emphasize news you can use and insight. Scholars love raw data. And so you, you don't have a lot of that energy because your your twin soul is someone that is not in your life and is busy with her own life somewhere else. But you do have a little bit of that. And so uh, combining with your sage energy, the scholar energy, perhaps makes you um, better able to study and assimilate a large, amounts of, uh, of, a large amount of data. 
so that adds um, adds to your verbal abilities. Now your uh, it's the third line on your chart says cadence position one, uh, purpose and simplicity, and that means that you have server casting. So in your spiritual family, your group of about a thousand to two thousand souls. Uh, you are in a group of seven sages called a cadence, and you're in the first position. And one is the server number. Server's another role. Servers are inspirational people. And so what this means, Jim, is that you like to direct your sage energies, especially into the server domain. Servers like to nurture people. They like to take care of their essential needs. They are especially concerned with the common good. And so you find a lot of servers in hospitality, um, cooking for people, you know, giving uh, uh, someone a back rub or being a sympathetic listener to their problems. Uh, servers are kindly and warm people, and because you are a server cast sage, it means that you like to use your sage communication skills and insights to serve the common good in particular. This could mean democracy. It could mean concern, being concerned that everyone has enough food to eat and so forth. Um, and it's also a kind of a leadership position because servers are first. The number one leads the way. So it's it's about leading by example. Very, very interesting because I, I, I hear those words and it sounds very familiar to me because that's stuff that I... I focus on taking care of making sure everything's done right and done for other people instead of myself. So it sounds very, very spot on, which is kind of, uh, it's good to hear, but it's kind of weird. It's humbling to hear, and it's kind of strange to hear at the same time. I guess that's, you know what I'm saying? Baffling. I do, yeah. It's it's, uh, quite amazing to hear some of these things. So. Your, your secondary casting, the, the middle number there, Cadence 7, is uh, a king secondary casting. And so that's kind of the opposite of server. One and seven are uh, two ends of one stick. And your secondary king casting means that especially to your friends and family, they see uh, leadership qualities. You may not see it so much yourself, but you also like to put your sage energies to work to help organize others to uh, accomplish a larger task. Yeah. May not, you know, it doesn't, doesn't may not be the raw raw leader, but it always seems to be the one people turn to when it something needs done. So yeah, I follow that. Yeah, they see you uh, as as a leader. The next line, it says cadre and entity, and that's your spiritual family. And that number won't mean a lot to you unless you start getting other people's charts and you learn what spiritual family they're in. But uh, it means something to me because I do know a lot of people uh, in your spiritual family. And next to that, it says love orientation. And that means that um, there are three forces that make up the universe, love, truth, and beauty. Love is more emotional. Truth is more intellectual, and beauty is more physical or kinesthetic. And every soul specializes in either one of these or two of them combined. And so with a love orientation as a soul, you always find as a sage that what you express to other people has a more loving, inclusive feeling about it. That, for example, if you had a truth orientation instead, you might be more uh, blunt with other people in saying what you think. And with the love orientation, you might uh, soften that a little bit uh, in favor of making sure that they feel cared for and nurtured, which goes in line with your server casting because servers are also nurturing people. So we don't just look at individual things on the chart. We look at the patterns. Yeah, makes. Hold on a second. My guest today is Shepard Hoodwin. I want to get that out, and we're talking about my Michael reading, so I just want to throw that back in there, so in case somebody's joining us midstream. So, so we're down to where were we? 
Um, Let's talk about your male-female uh, energy ratio. There we go. This is not a measure of masculinity or femininity. Everything on the Michael chart has a more specific definition than the way that it's normally used um, in our lives. So uh, we are defining male energy here as focused or goal-oriented and female energy as uh, radiant energy. So male energy is like a laser beam. It's designed to uh, get a job done. It moves in a straight line. Uh, for example, with a laser beam, you could carve a diamond if it was focused enough. Female energy would be more like the light from an incandescent bulb that shines everywhere. So people who are higher in female energy tend to be multitaskers. They tend to do a lot of things at once, um, you know, like the stereotypical 1950s housewife who would cook and clean and go to the dry cleaners and do the grocery store and take care of the kids. So that is a more... Um, uh, diffused kind of energy. It's more um, nurturing. It provides atmosphere. Male energy would be like the, the stereotypical um, husband in a 50s sitcom who left the house in the morning in a straight line, went to work, did one thing, focused on that one thing, and then came home. So that's linear. So you are higher in female energy, although like many souls, you are in the middle range. So your ratio is 39 to 61. It may suggest that you've had more female lifetimes than male lifetimes, but that is also subject to your individual preferences as a soul. And you will be attracted to partners who have the opposite ratio. So let's say you're in a, a relationship with a woman who's higher male energy. She may not feel masculine, but she might be more uh, linear, more focused, for example, more career-oriented uh, than you are. Yeah. Incidentally, if anybody listening would like to have me channel their micro-reading chart, if you go to my website, summerjoy.com, S-U-M-M-E-R-J-O-Y, on the left you'll see in red brochure, and you can click on that, and it gives you instructions on how to order one. Basically, you would just send me your full name, your photograph, your birth information, and if you've already had a Michael chart somewhere else, you should give me all the data. Now, you've had 12 previous cycles, and that's very interesting stuff because it means that before you were sage here on planet Earth having however many lifetimes, you've been on 12 other planets before this one in 12 different life forms playing the same game we're playing now. So we start as a unit of consciousness in the all that is, as a being, as a spark of the Tao, as we call it in the Michael teachings. We decide to do a planet. We make all these choices that have been outlined. And we start incarnating. And we have however many lifetimes on the physical plane that we choose to have. So some souls have 40 Earth lifetimes, and some have 400, and some people have even over 1,000. It's all a matter of personal choice, and it's uh, there's nothing that's good or bad. There's, there's no choices that are better or worse than others because we learn from all of them. It's just a matter of the course that we want to take. So that's the journey of our soul. And when we're all done with the physical plane, we focus our attention on the next plane of existence because there are actually seven planes of existence and the physical is just the beginning of this journey. The next one is the astral and we'll be there for a while. And the next one after that is the causal. And the Michael group are from the causal plane. Then we ascend through the four higher planes until we're reabsorbed back into the Tao. And at that point, as this eternal being, we might decide to do another planet. And then it would all start over, but everything on your chart would be completely different if you chose. So you've done this 12 times before, and every time you play a planetary game, it gives you more complexity, it gives you more layers. The average person on Earth has had four previous cycles, and you've had 12, so you're more complex than the average person. The highest number we know anyone has had is 19. For example, the man Jesus had had 19. He was a very complex soul. Again, not better or worse, just different. I was going to ask you how many, how many was the highest, because 12 seems a bit high to me, but I don't 
I haven't seen any of these before, but I guess I was, guess I'm right. Seemed a little, little high, but that's okay. It is, I guess, what it is. It, it is what it is right now, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Again, no, no better or worse. It's all, it's all good. That's one of the things that we learn in the Michael teachings is that it really is all good because every experience is an opportunity to grow, to refine and expand our experience as sparks of the Tao. So, I got one quick question: Have you ever seen anybody with like a one or a zero? Is there still no, no? I haven't, because those people would not be drawn to me, and, and neither would their friends. So, no one would ask for their charts. Ah, they okay. do exist. But um, the lowest number I've gotten for previous cycles is four. And four is also the average for the planet. But as someone with four cycles is going to be having a simpler experience of Earth. Uh, they don't really have the wherewithal to be concerned with something complicated like the Michael teachings. They're, they're dealing more with the basics. And the more cycles you've had, the more you want to play around with things and mix it up a little bit. Okay, makes sense. I was just wondering. Okay. Everything we've talked about is in the top half of your term, essence, and essence is a word for soul. So everything we've talked about is true of you in every lifetime you have had and will have on Earth. Now we're going to talk about your overleaves, which pertain in this particular combination at least to this lifetime only. So these can change from lifetime to lifetime. It's very interesting to think about how a soul can be from lifetime to lifetime. Have you ever done any past life regression? Actually, I had somebody uh, do a, a reading of one past life a few weeks ago, or last week I guess it was. Uh, they were a guest on another show, and I called in because, you know, the good radio show host, you know, helps his buddy out when no one else is calling in. So, yeah, I've I've, I've discussed it with them at different points. So, yeah, it's it's interesting to hear the different stories that they were, that they were telling. Well, one thing you discover is just how different you can be. Yes. So... One lifetime you uh, you may be uh, have a very quiet life, and in another lifetime you may be uh, in charge of a lot of other people. Uh, even your personality can seem different, and that's because the overleaves are different. So some overleaves make you a more subdued person, some make you a more extroverted person, some some make you more intellectual, some more emotional, and so forth. And so knowing this not only about yourself but about other people helps you to be more uh, understanding of the differences among us and again realizing that it's all good that it's all okay we have nine needs and we all need all nine of these things to some degree but in the Michael teachings we rank them in priority from one to nine and the needs things that you need to have in order to do your life task your life task is the central spiritual lesson of this lifetime for you. Your top three needs are adventure, expansion, and expression. So the ad adventure need is the need to take risks and have new experiences as you define them. So it's not necessarily for you going to be going out and skydiving. For you, an adventure might be found through a book but if you don't feel like you're taking adventures in your life, you will feel stymied, like I can't do what I'm here to do. The expansion need is the need to grow things. And so with a high expansion need, you would like building a business, being entrepreneurial, for example, or planting a garden and seeing the, uh, the, the harvest grow from year to year. The expression need is a very common one for sages. It's a need for you to express yourself and feel heard, and it could mean you're drawn to community theater, for example, or doing this radio program. Yeah, I mean, those all fit. I mean, I can, yeah. Especially the adventure one, because every, every once in a while, you know, you, well, you're from California, so you probably don't have that many dirt roads, but you just get out and... Get away from it all. Uh, yeah, I need that, so I, I can follow it. 
Totally. The goal is our primary motivator. It's what pulls us through our lifetime. It's what we most want out of any experience. And more than any other trait on the chart, it determines what your life looks like. The most popular goal is the goal of growth, and that's yours. And people in growth have lifetimes with a lot of stimulation. People in growth are motivated to be busy. They're motivated to find something new that will challenge them. And when they handle it, when they have that experience, they grow. They learn something. So it could be learning a new language, learning a new cuisine, learning a new computer skill. Um, And people in growth are busy with their own stuff. They're not as busy with other people's stuff. As opposed to, say, someone with a goal of submission who tends to devote him or herself to a larger concept like serving a cause or submitting to a leader. The opposite of submission is dominance where you are the leader. And then sometimes people go back and forth between the opposites. So someone in submission might slide to dominance and temporarily take a leadership position or vice versa. The opposite of growth is reevaluation, which is which strips away the busyness, which quiets things down. So when you feel overwhelmed uh, because you've had too much stimulation, that's the negative pull of growth, which is called confusion, you may then slide to reevaluation where you strip away all the stuff from your schedule and you just go sit for a while, veg and catch up on your, your processing until you're ready for more growth. My goal is called acceptance, and it makes for a very different lifetime than growth. If you're in growth and you have a problem, it's usually something you can overcome if you work really hard. People in acceptance tend to have lifetimes filled with problems that they can't fix, and they have to learn to just make peace with it the way that it is. So that's acceptance. Positive pull is agape, which means unconditional love, uh, being in equanimity, being at peace, Negative pull is ingratiation, where you try too hard to uh, win the acceptance of others. In the positive pull, people in acceptance accept that others may not always accept them, and they are at peace with that. So um, the opposite of that is discrimination. People in discrimination uh, are learning about saying no rather than saying yes. They are uh, sophisticated people in the positive pull. They are rejecting people in the negative pull. If you see someone who is constantly driving other people away from them, they may have a goal of discrimination. They may also have an attitude of cynic or skeptic, which can have a similar effect, although they have different causalities. The goal of flow is also pretty common, and those are people who are either uh, having rest times rest lifetimes where they're just learning how to relax or they're learning how to let go and let the universe guide them to where they need to be. And so you with a goal of growth, when you're confronted with a challenge, you quickly go into a hands-on mode. People with a goal of flow, if they're going to be in their positive pull, a lot of times their proper approach is to see what the universe brings them and just put themselves in the hands of that flow. So again, a very different kind of lifetime. In the negative pole, people in flow can get really stuck because they're not flowing. They they are uh, inert. But the positive pole, they have a sense of the flow and they let themselves be carried on there. Yeah. Attitudes are how we look at the world, and you and I have something else in common in that we're both idealists. So we look at the world and uh, we see how it can be made better. And as a sage idealist, because you'll notice if you look at your chart, sage and idealists are both on the same side of the expression axis, so they, they reinforce each other. And so a sage idealist is very idealistic, very visionary. We love ideas as sages. And an idealist has a lot of ideas about how the world can be improved, and we're always trying to do that. We see how things should be. 
like, wow, this would just work so much better if they just changed this. So we're all about change. And a lot of people aren't, so they may buckle at that. But uh, idealists tend to be optimists. We tend to be cheerful. We tend to uh, bring ideas to others about how things could be made better. In the negative pole abstraction, the ideas aren't workable, so they have to be tested in the real world. But in the positive pole, we bring things together so that they really do change in a profitable way. Yeah, I, I always have ideas, so that just doesn't surprise me at all. <laughs> <laughs> now, the mode is the way you run your energy. And this is probably the most visible overleaf to other people. You are in passion mode. And what that means is that uh, you don't do anything halfway. You either do it all the way or not at all. And you like to throw yourself completely into whatever you're doing. So you're not trying to restrict the outflow of energy. It's just 100%. The positive pull is self-actualization, which means that you have uh, poured yourself in so fully that you get all the way to the finish line. The negative pull identification means you threw yourself in but lost yourself. You lost your boundaries. You lost your sense of who you are. So, for example, you throw yourself into a relationship so much that you, you forget about your own needs, and then you start to feel lost. So it's like, um, let's say you come across someone in quicksand. In the positive pole, you tie a rope around a tree and throw them the other end. In the negative pole, you jump in the quicksand with the person who's already in the quicksand, and now there's two. But it does mean you do everything um, passionately, and you are also emotionally centered, which is the next item. And so that passion will show up as emotional passion. Do people think of you as a passionate person? Yes. Oh, yeah. They, to a, probably a fault at points, you know, like you were saying, getting too deep into something. So, yeah. You wear your heart on your sleeve. An emotionally centered person in passion mode is just all out there on the surface for everyone to see. Now, the opposite of passion mode is reserve. And the quintessential archetype of reserve mode is a ballet dancer. So um, the ballet dancer is seeking to control her every muscle to create something beautiful, graceful, swan-like, delicate. Passion mode is like a dancer in a nightclub who's just letting it all hang out, not trying to control anything. And there are pros and cons to both approaches. So reserve mode, person can be overly inhibited, can be uptight, and passion mode can uh, not be get out of control. So it can happen either way. Uh, some of the other modes are caution. Caution is a common mode. Caution means that you move with deliberation. Uh, in the negative pole, caution mode, people are phobic. They just become paralyzed by fear. They can't take any action at all because they're afraid it's going to be the wrong thing. And that is the opposite of power mode, where people bear down too hard, oppressively, in the negative pole. In the positive pole, they carry authority. So let's say, as a soul, you tend to be pretty uh, quiet, pretty, um, pretty reserved, and you want to have a lifetime where people listen to you, where you come across as having more authority, you then might choose power mode to facilitate that. Perseverance mode, people are doggedly persistent in uh, whatever they do. They, they can, in the negative pole, not know when to let go of something. But in the positive pole, it allows them to hang in there when maybe the circumstances are quite difficult and other people would have given up. People in aggression mode are dynamic. They're exciting. They juggle a lot of balls in the air at one time. Uh, in the negative pole belligerence, they might fly off the handle and throw those balls at someone else. So aggression mode is a tricky one to, to handle well. Half the population is in observation mode. I'm in observation mode. They come across as neutral. They're doing a lot of staring. Sometimes they don't mind their own business. From the neutral overleaves, uh, such as observation, pragmatism, and flow, 
you can slide or temporarily move over to any of the others. So observation mode is a good perch to sample uh, some or all the other modes. We have uh, seven centers. Every human being has seven centers. These are the parts of the personality. We have our emotions, and we have our higher emotions, which are like the more of the overarching, exalted kind of emotions. We have our intellect, and we have our higher intellect, which is more conceptual, broad type of thinking. We have our body, our physical reactions, and then so we can move the whole body and have exalted experiences of the body. And we have our instincts. On your Michael chart, it says that you're emotionally centered, and that means that this is the center that you as a soul chose for this lifetime to be the front door of your soul, of your personality. So when something happens, when someone knocks on your front door, your emotions answer. I'm intellectually centered, so when someone knocks on my front door, I think, my intellect answers. People who are centered in their bodies um, react with action or with physical sensations. And that also determines a lot how your, your personality looks. So as an emotionally centered person, your eyes are probably more watery a lot of the time. People see your emotions. You react with your emotions. You show them to others. Even though you're in a male body and men are trained to be less emotional, you probably cry more than the average man does. You're easily touched with tears. And that was a deliberate choice on the part of your soul. You wanted to experience this lifetime predominantly emotionally. Yeah, Does I've that fit for you? Yeah, I was going to say, I've been told that I don't have a gr the best poker face in the world. So, yeah, that fits. The opposite end of the spectrum there you're talking about from, from tears, but there's some truth to that as well. It's just all, you know, it's always there. So Yeah, your ability to feel um, is available to you unless you know unless you've specifically tamped it down but it is there it is right out front with you now you're in the intellectual part of the emotional center which means that your thoughts tend to spring from your emotions so if you had a good feeling about something then you will construct the thought based on that feeling and if you had a negative feeling about something that will determine how you think about that. This centering combination is the best one for reading other people because your emotions tell you what's really going on with other people. You can feel them. And then the ability to articulate that because the intellectual part of the emotional center articulates your emotions means that you, uh, you can read people. You're not easily fooled. If someone's lying to you, you can probably tell. Yeah. Usually. There's, yeah. <laughs> as an idealist, uh, you want to trust people. You want to have faith in people, but you can still feel. You can feel people. Yeah. You probably give them the benefit of the doubt, and try to understand their motivations because sages do that. We want to understand people's motivations. We love understanding people. We love learning about people. We love their stories. We love telling stories. We love biographies. We love quotes, quotable quotes and so forth. Oh, yes, I do so love you quotes. you probably <laughs> have... Yeah, sages collect quotes. Just love quotes. I, I have since I was a child also. But um, with the centering, you can feel... You can feel other people's stuff, but you probably also have a lot of understanding and compassion about it. Yeah. Always trying to understand why they would even go that route, because, you know, the truth's always so much better. Da, 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 da. Yep. Exactly, yeah. Um, everyone has a weak link in their chain in terms of their center. So you're emotionally centered in the intellectual part. What's missing? The body. So the last thing you'll get around to is taking action. The last thing you'll get around to is the physical bodily experience. And whatever we can do to balance our centers, meaning making sure that all three areas, body, mind, and emotion, are represented on a daily basis, 
the better we're going to feel, the happier we will be. So for you, the challenge is getting your body moving and being in touch with your body's feelings. And so anything you can do to make more of that uh, is helpful. You mentioned just sort of getting out in nature and stuff. That's a great way to do that. Yeah. I've noticed the chief the chief obstacle over their stubbornness, and I was just thinking about as a because that was like when I opened this today, I looked at it. You know, you sent it to me a couple weeks ago, and I opened it again today, and that was where my eyes went because I've been thinking about doing something for the last week, and it's, there's always an excuse in my mind why I shouldn't do it. And then I open that up today, and I see that word, and I'm like, that's exactly what you're being with this. <laughs> The chief obstacle is the focus of our fears and illusions. Um, There are seven of them, just like there are seven of the other overleaves. And we all have traits of all seven at times. So we're all sometimes self-deprecating. We're all sometimes a little arrogant. We're all sometimes self-destructive or greedy or martyred or impatient. But the one that you chose as a soul to try to master in this lifetime, to, to really learn as much about as you can is called stubbornness and stubbornness in the Michael teachings is defined as a fear of change it often derives from a childhood or even past lives where other people didn't give you proper choices your parents just force things on you all the time and so you learn to resist you learn to dig in and say no one's going to tell me what to do and if that gets too extreme, it becomes the chief obstacle. The extreme is uh, where you have a knee-jerk reaction to uh, whatever whatever other people are trying to um, influence you dig in your heels. And there's this belief that any change that happens is going to be a bad one. The chief obstacles don't kick in in every situation. They only kick in where you have a lot of fear and stress can bring it on. And so having a word for it gives you a chance to um, to observe it. We call that photographing it, noticing it in action, so that you can take steps to avoid it, to be more flexible, to be more fluid, to let other people make some of the decisions. And that will make you happier because the chief obstacle always makes you unhappy. But it thinks it's protecting you. It thinks it's um, uh, keeping something bad away from you. But it's dysfunctional. It's not the best way to achieve that aim. If you've had a lot of bad experiences where people didn't listen to you, then it's good to be aware of expressing your feelings. You do have a need of expression of making sure that your input is heard, but also realizing that it's fair to take turns in making decisions and letting other people also have input also. If you say so, I'm just kidding. No, I do do agree. There's times. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Stubbornness is the obstacle that is most invisible to the people who have it because it's neutral. It's... uh, some, uh, the, some of the traits on the chart in the far right column, we call those neutral because uh, they're on the assimilation axis. And so they're kind of invisible. And stubbornness is something that's easy to rationalize as, uh, you know, I'm just standing up for myself. But because it's fear-based, it tends to blind the person. And so to get rid of our chief obstacle it takes a lot of work to look at ourselves in the mirror. Now, other people will feel that they're always coming up against this glass wall that, uh, you know, that you just can't get the other person to budge. And it's very frustrating for them. But the person who has that trait often uh, can't see it or won't see it. And it's easy to say you don't, that you're not stubborn. Uh, the opposite of that is the obstacle called impatience. People that impatience... Uh, well, almost everyone will say they're impatient because nobody likes waiting in line, no one likes being stuck in traffic, um, and so forth. And our modern world has a lot of those kinds of indignities about them. 
But in the Michael teachings, we define impatience more specifically than that. It's defined as a fear of missing out. And so people in impatience deeply believe on a gut level that there isn't enough time, that they never get to do the things they want to do, and they're chomping at the bits. They're always living in the future. They're not relaxed. And so that's what impatience means in the Michael teachings. The opposite of martyrdom, in impatience, people push themselves to the front of the line. In martyrdom, people deliberately take on unnecessary suffering to prove that they're worthy. And that can get people into a lot of trouble. You know, like I, I, I knew a woman who was in prison basically because uh, she had this belief system. And she told me when I, I explained her chart to her that um, she knew her mother was a martyr and she always swore she would never be like that. So it got more subtle with her. She was able to hide it more. But it still was lurking in her subconscious and got her into a lot of trouble. Greed is a fear of loss or want. People in greed do not necessarily look greedy. They may be generous. Greed is not always fixated on money. It could be fixated on experience. Like, I can never have enough experience, or I can never have enough food, or I can never have enough drugs, or I can never have enough friends. It's a feeling that you have a big hole in you and nothing ever fills it up. And it usually comes from a childhood where your parents or other adults did not give you love but gave you substitutes. So if they, you know, said, here's $10, go out and buy yourself something, but they didn't really listen to you and care about you, then the greed will tend to be fixated on money. Whereas if um, if you had a mother who was cold but she was always stuffing you with food, then in your subconscious, food is love and you keep stuffing yourself trying to fill the hole. So these are really interesting conundrums for the soul to try to figure out. It's sort of like Houdini locking himself into a box with chains around it and trying to figure out how to get, get the heck out of that box. So we, we set up challenges on the physical plane that are difficult, and in figuring how to get out of them, we learn a lot. We develop as souls. We become more compassionate, more kind, more wise. Our light shines brighter, and that's really why we're here. The opposite of greed is self-destruction. So greed or people in greed are always trying to add things to themselves to make themselves feel better. And in self-destruction, people are trying to subtract things from themselves. They don't feel like their lives are worth living. And it stems from a fear of loss of control, which means um, often a childhood where there wasn't enough structure, where there was nothing they could count on, and they didn't have any discipline. And so they're always looking for something to hang on to, some anchor. They don't feel anchored. So it could be alcohol. It could be food also, even though it's more associated with greed. Uh, it's just a, a veering from one extreme of being super self-disciplined and the other extreme of losing all control. So it's like with the alcoholic, they binge and purge. They, they, they go out and they, they get smashed and then they feel really guilty about it and they're very repressed about, uh, you know, I'm not going to drink, I'm not going to drink, I'm not going to drink, and then it becomes to be too much and then they binge again. So self-destruction is the other obstacle that can get people into really uh, big trouble, which can include literal self-destruction where they, they kill themselves because they just, they get so tired of trying to find that self-control or, or, or circumstances that they just give up. Arrogance is a fear of being judged and being found wanting by others, and people with arrogance tend to put a wall around themselves and uh, be overly critical of themselves and others. The opposite is self-destruction, where people um, uh, believe that they are inadequate. They just deeply believe it and... and and they don't try to defend against it. They say, oh, yeah, you're right. You know, they don't even bother to try sometimes because they're so convinced that they don't have what it takes. So all of these are ego manifestations. None of them are good things to have, but they all teach us things by dealing with them, by, by trying to outfox them. Uh, we learn more about what love is because in love, 
we don't judge ourselves as either being better than others or worse than others. We're equal to others. And in in love, we don't want to destroy ourselves and we don't want to add something to ourselves. We just want to be ourselves. And in martyrdom uh, that is about um, suffering, in love, we don't need to suffer and we don't need to push ahead to the next thing. Uh, we can just be in the present moment. And in stubbornness, uh, which is a lack of flowing, uh, in love we learn to flow. We learn to just be flexible and fluid in our lives. So it's all all about learning love. Yeah, love would be a good thing, or you know, a better thing for everybody to have, <laughs> I guess. I don't think you get too many arguments. <laughs> I know. I, I was pretty. I was pretty. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, love is a good thing. Love's a good thing. It is. Anybody wants to argue, email Shepard about that. Don't bother me. Don't waste my time with that. No. <laughs> <laughs> the body type is the influence of the celestial bodies on your physical body. And there are seven main body types, but there are also three others that are um, possible minor influences in the body type. And you have a combination of jovial, which is the planet Jupiter, and lunar, which is the moon. These are both what we call passive body types. So body types are either passive or active. A passive body type is a softer body that likes staying put, and active body types like to move. Your body type is 100% passive. So getting yourself moving physically is not as attractive to you as someone with a 100% active body type. Those people tend to be in motion all the time. Um, for some of us, it's a real discipline to go out and exercise, but for people with a 100% active body type, they might feel it's a punishment not to be allowed to go out and exercise because they have all this pent-up energy that they've, got, they've just got to move. They've got to act. And that's because of the way the body type is. Souls who have chosen passive body types for the lifetime are probably seeking to do more sedentary kinds of activities. So I have a, a lunar body type, and that's the most passive of the body types. And it's really good for people who are writing books because you need to be able to sit still for a long time. And people who are active uh, in their body types, they don't want a desk job. They would go nuts with that. They don't want to sit at the computer. They don't find it comfortable. They've got to move. They want to get out there in the field. And uh, they may even like, you know, traveling, being on planes, being in motion all the time. Now, Jovial is named after the planet Jupiter, and we also call people who are friendly and like parties and like people and are open-hearted and generous enjoy the pleasures of life, we think of them as jovial, and, and that is true of this body type. The jovials tend to have that kind of personality. So body types have another set of traits that can either be positive charged or negative charged. And a positive charged body tends to have a positive outlook on life. And to be happier, they tend to look at the world and see the glass as uh, half full. The negative charged body types, like lunar, you're secondary, so you're going to be kind of in the middle on this issue. You're not totally one or the other. Negative body types tend to see the glass half empty. They're very sensitive. They feel the flaws. Now, you might think it would be better to have a positive body type, but the downfall of that is sometimes someone with a real highly positive body type can uh, easily uh, dismiss warning signals they don't read the handwriting on the wall, and they smash into the wall as a result. Negative charged bodies give you the capacity to see what the problems are and prevent them before they happen. But it can also be a little bit like the princess and the pea. If you have a negative body type, you tend to be less comfortable because you do notice the things uh, that, are, that are wrong. They make you uncomfortable. The other trait of the body types is masculine and feminine. Jovial is a masculine body and lunar is a feminine. And what that means is in a masculine body, the energy moves out, and in a feminine, the energy moves in. So in a jovial body is outgoing. The energy moves out. It's friendly. 
uh, it dissipates energy. Like it has excess energy, and it's sort of letting everyone else share that energy. So that would be the equivalent of throwing a big party and buying lots of food and liquor and give, showing everyone a good time. Lunar is feminine, and it absorbs. And so um, it tends to be more self-protected, more quiet, and also lunar is a very intellectual body type. It tends to be dreamy like the moon. You think of people sitting up at night, looking at the moon, writing poetry, dreaming. Uh, you think of uh, the computer nerd, the, uh, the, the, the geek who stays up all night uh, writing software code and surfing the web. That's a typical lunar kind of, of stereotype. We have body type attraction with souls who have the opposite of our body type. So um, you have body type attraction primarily with mercurial. Mercurial is the opposite of jovial. And Saturnian, Saturn is the opposite of lunar. So uh, mercurial body type uh, would be someone who had a compact body, who was lively and flexible. A lot of gymnasts uh, have a mercurial body type. People who are good at yoga, uh, yoga, they're very flexible, have mercurial body types. They usually have an oval face, and they tend to be wound up and have a lot of energy. Uh, clean, bright, quick. They're quick and jovial is laid back, so they're opposites. You also have body type attraction with Saturnians. Saturnians are calmer. They have, uh, they're active, but in a calm way. They have a prominent bone structure, high forehead. Uh, and both of those types tend to be lean, whereas jovial and lunars tend to put on weight. They tend to have more padding on them. That can easily get out of control, especially living in our time when it's so easy to get so much cheap food. So jovials can really balloon up. Uh, in this uh, environment, whereas a Saturn or Mercurial is not as likely to do that because they are moving a lot and they have faster metabolisms. Hmm. So this is not to say that you are always going to be sexually attracted to people who have Mercurial or Saturnian body types because you're going to also have a crib sheet of the traits that you personally like things that you, you find to be beautiful or charming or attractive. You know, For example, you might like blondes, you might like redheads, and that isn't necessarily a body type uh, attribute. But you will have body type attractions with someone who's mercurial, Saturnian, or both. Hmm. Interesting. Very interesting. The last item on the chart is the soul age, and uh, that tells what your lessons are about. So when, in our first lifetime, we are first level infant soul, and there are seven levels to every soul age. So you go first level infant, second level infant, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and then first level baby, second level baby, so forth, to young, mature, and old. We don't have a lot of infant souls on earth anymore. Uh, you'll find them usually in tribal places and jungles, uh, living very simple lives, but you'll also find them in urban jungles where they're just learning how to survive. They're just getting used to the physical plane. And uh, they're simple. They can be um, radiant like newborn babies, and they can also throw tantrums like newborn babies. They don't... Um, they don't have a lot of coping skills for the physical plane yet, so that's what they're here to learn. Baby souls are learning how to live within civilization. The stereotypical fundamentalist of any religion is a baby soul because they're, they like simple rules. They like society to look a certain way, and they like it to be fairly predictable. Young souls are breaking out of that somewhat, and they are looking to structure the outer world in their own way, and these are the Donald Trumps. Of but the um, average human is a fifth level young on Earth today, so it's very common. So not every young soul is rich and successful, but they tend to be ambitious and work hard to try to achieve that because that's what their lessons are about as souls. And then as souls, we turn the corner into the mature soul cycle. It's sort of like hitting adolescence where suddenly 
we're having all these new feelings, we're, our emotions are in the forefront, and we're focusing on uh, relationships with other people that can teach us more about ourselves. So we're plunging deep in the mature cycle. And it's, it's, that's the area where the greatest artistic masterpieces come from. Uh, a lot of the European countries are mature soul. They're more concerned about community, about uh, helping the needy, about communicating, working things out, uh, settling things by consensus rather than from the top down. The old soul cycle is the most philosophical and laid back, seeking an overview. And you are at seventh level old, which means you are on one of your last lifetimes on Earth. So you're wrapping things up. You're on the, the, the finish, finish round. And at uh, seventh level old, the soul is wrapping things up internally. You've already pretty much wrapped up things with other people. You don't have a lot of karma with other people. You like to keep things really clean with other people. You don't want to uh, start something messy that you're going to have to finish later. You, want, uh, you don't want to owe anything to other people. You're trying to find your soul tribe. You're trying to find the people that you really connect with. And you want to finish up on lessons about like your self-worth, uh, how you treat yourself, how you feel about yourself, how you think about yourself, and so forth. Yeah. Especially the part of trying to just keep other people, keep the messes away. Yeah. I feel that. Yeah, very typical, very typical at seventh level old, uh, because you know that you're not going to have a lot more time on the physical plane to complete things. So that's what you're trying to do now. Just, just amazing to hear all this stuff and uh, journey of your soul. A, a, a channel explores the Michael teachings. It is a new book. Go out and get it because he's pretty much nailed what I, how I think of myself. So it's just going to be interesting to to delve into how he's got there. But like I said, he's pretty much nailed what I am. So for what it's just baffling to me that. You were able to pick that up from just those few things. That the what was that again? Picture, birth date, and yes, um, a photo, a birth date, and full name. Yeah, just amazing how you were able to nail me so so closely of just fragments of you know information. And um, summer summerjoy dot com is his website if you want to go there and check out the book and all the other things that he's got going on. So. Get that out there one more time. And Journey of Your Soul is available uh, at uh, most bookstores and in ebook form uh, through Kindle, through iBook, through Nook, through uh, Sony, through most of the uh, formats. Just amazing stuff, Shepard. Well, I want to thank you for doing it, and I want to thank you for explaining it and all that fun stuff. So, my pleasure. I don't know what else to say. Just go go get the book. Drop him a message. Tell him, tell him how wrong he was. If you, if you notice a big flaw that I don't notice, but just go tell him how wrong I was, or tell me how wrong he was about something. Either way, <laughs> you know, I you're you know it's a little too close to the situation sometimes. Sometimes you think you're something, and you know everybody else is like, no, not really. That's not you. You know how that goes. <laughs> Be interesting to get the feedback if anybody wants to uh, to humor us or tell us, um, but. Hey, with that, I'm going to let you go enjoy the rest of your afternoon. You as well. Thanks ha for having me on. Oh, no problem. And anytime, anytime anything else comes out, you know where to find me. Okay, great. It's a deal. Okay. Thanks, Shepard. You bet. Bye-bye. And that's Shepard Hoodwin in uh, summerjoy.com. And like I said, hey, if you if you, if you you see you heard him say something about me that you don't think is quite true, I talk to normal at gmail.com. Send it over. We can... So we could, you know, I'm just interested because I, I think he was pretty close to being spot on. So, hey, it is what it is, right? Have a good afternoon, everybody. Well, before we flip that on-air sign to the off position, a quick reminder. For all things about the report, previews, and reviews, go to italkparanormal.com. That's italkparanormal.com. Good night. This is Thomas Fusco author of the book Behind the Cosmic Veil, A New Vision of Reality, and you are listening to The Mallard Report. 
Hey everybody, it's the Mallory Report. Oh,